I'm Patrick Pacheco. Coming up on Theater All the Moving Parts, a conversation with producer Ken Davenport as we follow the rapidly developing story of Broadway in crisis and the hopes for the future. Hello, I'm Patrick Pacheco. Welcome to this episode of Theater All the Moving Parts, streamed from my home through the magic of the internet. Today's guest is Tony winning producer Ken Davenport, who is also the host of the podcast, The Producer's Perspective. We're talking about the ongoing crisis in the theater and the hopes for the future. Welcome, Ken, to Theater All the Moving Parts. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here and, and to see you, if not uh, be in the same room with you, Pat. How are you getting on? Well, like everyone else, I think, uh, in this business and in the world, you know, I'm trying to keep a smile on my face. And, uh, but obviously, it's challenging in a lot of ways. Um, so we're taking it not even a day at a time. I'm taking it an hour at a time, a minute at a time at this point. But we're getting through it. Let me ask you a question you're fond of asking, and that is, on March 12th, when the theater closed, where were you and what was on your agenda? So I had actually just gotten back from uh, Cleveland, Ohio, where I had uh, flown to see the Jesus Christ Superstar tour, uh, because in addition to my independent activities, I'm also Andrew Lloyd Webber's executive producer in North America. So I look after uh, his stuff, and I'd flown out to check in on the tour, and I was in a, a very large theater, you know, thousands of people in that touring uh, house. And it was a tense moment, actually, and something was changing. I went to lunch and there was no one in the restaurant. Uh, and it was supposed to be the beginning of March Madness, the college basketball tournament. And then that night in the theater, I remember being there and just a little bit of an edge and someone would cough and about 50 people would turn around and think, what's going on? <laughs> that said, the show went off uh, tremendously well. And then I checked, uh, our president was speaking that night and I turned my, my phone on after the performance and he had canceled all the inbound traffic from Europe. Uh, and actually I was sitting with one of the really useful uh, uh, staffers and I said, I don't know if you're gonna get home. And when he canceled the flight, that's when I knew, whoa, this was different. I got nervous about getting home myself. And I said, things are about to change. And sure enough, I flew back the next day, Broadway shut down. Have you continued working on your projects or has everything stopped cold? Yeah, you know, listen, you can't stop in this business. You always have to be moving things ahead. Even when there isn't a global pandemic, you always have to be working extra hard to get your shows off the ground. This is a very challenging business. Never mind when you have a headwind like we have right now. So yeah, actually, as a lot of people in the business, I think, are finding, I'm working more and harder. Uh, in fact, the first live stream I did uh, during this pandemic was with uh, Stephen Schwartz. And Stephen, who obviously at the, at the height of success in this business, was like, Ken, I, I find myself working harder than I ever have. I'm having more meetings than ever, which is exciting, which is good. But yeah, I'm, the first thing I had to do was take all the things that I had slated for certain calendar slots and frankly, pick them up and just move them forward and drop them down. How did you know where to drop them down, Ken? The first one that happened was uh, I have the rights to the Warner Brothers National Lampoon franchise, the vacation movies. I'm developing a new musical called Broadway Vacation. It was set to premiere in Seattle in the fall. That was the first one because Seattle was impacted even before we were, right? So we picked that up and moved it to next spring. So we pushed it far enough out. And then some others were pushing. I'm just pushing much further out than I ever would have thought. And honestly, uh, my Neil Diamond project, which hadn't even been announced, we had an out of town set and ready to go that we had not announced yet. And we were thinking about announcing it and we just held off and held off. And that's the advice I've been giving people and certainly taking for myself now is every time I've made a decision, I don't 
do anything about the decision for another 48 hours because usually something is going to change. Um, we should probably ask the question that's un unanswerable, and that's the elephant in the room. You've often said uh, we can't ask when Broadway is going to come back because A, nobody knows, and B, it'll be later than we hope for. That said, what is your hope for date for Broadway coming back? Well, you know, I'm going to give you an answer which is not going to be the specific answer that you'd like. My hope is that Broadway comes back as soon as people want to come back to Broadway. I mean, I, the, one of the first live streams I did was a, a very optimistic push saying, we're gonna get through this, which we will. We're, Broadway is gonna come back, it will. It will reach heights bigger than the ones that we had had before, and it will. Who knows how long that'll take. But the other thing I said is just imagine that first night at the theater. So just wait, imagine for a moment, you're in one of those houses, you're seeing Hamilton, you're seeing Wicked, you're seeing Phantom, you're seeing Six, and it's the first night the curtain goes up. I mean, it's going to be electric. It's going to be electric. It'll probably be, Ken, like the first time uh, theaters went up after 9-11. Obviously, that was just a couple of days, but it was electric in the theater. Yeah, so imagine it being out for months and getting that, you know, it's that thirst of ours. But I want to make sure that everyone has the feeling of that electricity and wants to be around everybody in a full house. So I, I want us to wait until we're really ready to go back. As a producer, who do you look for guidance? Do you look to the Broadway League? Do you look to other entities that are looking out for your interests? Yeah, so, you know, I've been saying that I've been, the, the real people I've been listening to from the top down on this have been the doctors. You know, I've been listening to Fauci for sure, who's, uh, I've been listening to Cuomo. I think Cuomo has done an amazing job, uh, although I'm still wondering why he didn't put a member of the Broadway community on that, on that giant advisory board he just assembled. But uh, everything else he's done has been pretty good. So I've been listening to that. And of course, the Broadway League. I mean, what's amazing about this industry is that we're a bit of a dysfunctional family, right? I often describe the Broadway community. Uh, it's like a giant Thanksgiving dinner. Like we all sit down and we all love each other. And then we go in other rooms and we're like, did you hear what you know, crazy Uncle Albert just said? Like what's dance so-and-so doing? And at the moment, we're experiencing the best Thanksgiving dinner you could ever imagine. Like, the industry is pulled together and people that would be competing, including, by the way, unions, like everyone's gathering together and say, we in, we're in this because we love the theater and it's important and it's important to the city and to all of us. What can we do to get it back? So, and certainly the league has been taking that charge. What's the prevailing mood among your peers, other producers in the business? I think it's an interesting one, you know, and just like I said at the beginning, it kind of ebbs and flows. We are theater people. We're in a business that doesn't make a lot of sense to be in in the first place, to be honest, especially for producers. You know, whenever anyone like points the finger at producers for like, oh, they just want to make money, I always laugh because I was like, producers are smart people. Like, if they, we wanted to make money, we'd be doing something else. Um, <laughs> so, there, you know, we're, we're in it because we love it to begin with. So, we are still passionate and optimistic about finding solutions. We've never been in this situation before. So there is this, I don't have precedent. I don't, I, like, I don't quite know, but everyone again is still, you know, I'm on five, seven Zoom calls a day. People just checking in, like, what do you think? What are you doing? How can we work together to accomplish something good? Um, speaking of Cuomo and Mayor de Blasio, there's no question that survival is going to depend on federal, state, and city aid. How confident are you, and I suppose from a commercial point of view first, just from Broadway, uh, from the Broadway's perspective, how confident are you that government will help Broadway producers get back on their feet? It's, that's a very good question because I, I remember post 9-11 and the government very quickly remembering, frankly, because it's not always top of mind. They remember that oh, right, Broadway is so vital, we better tell everyone to go see a Broadway show. Because the trickle-down economics, to use a phrase that no one likes to use anymore, but 
People go see Broadway shows, which means they fill restaurants, which means they use taxis, which means they use all this stuff, right? And our impact is enormous. But often Broadway, to be honest, is we, they forget about us until they need us. And actually this advisory council thing, I think is one of those moments. It's, it's a little sexier to go after the CEO of these major corporations or fashion or these kinds of things. But so I, I, I'm confident because I do believe they, they remember and they're like, oh right, and Broadway is really the heartbeat of New York City, right? New York City is the heartbeat of the state. But they often forget, you know, we're, we're like that, um, that uh, friend that is always there for us, but we forget because they're always there. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, Charlotte St. Martin, who's the head of the Broadway League, is often reminding them that the, the, the theater is, is, uh, is, uh, brings in $14.9 billion a year. To uh, to government and to the city, so I mean I don't know why they necessarily need that reminder, but in terms of the advisory committee, I was always also aware that Cuomo did have a talk with um, certain heads of the Broadway community or included the Broadway community. I think Scott Rudin was there and some other some other producers were there as well. Uh, did you get any sense from Scott or other producers how that call went down? There is an understanding, obviously, and a and desire. They know, obviously, what we do in, in the economic impact that you that you quoted there. And what I, you know, their biggest, from what I'm hearing, one of the biggest concerns is that there may be a stigma attached to New York in general when this is all over, right? Forget Broadway, forget New York City. New York was the epicenter of the entire pandemic at this point, right? People are forgetting about Wuhan in a way because New York has so many cases and so much um, tragedy. And I think there's, there's this concern about tourism and will they come back, right? And right. yes, of course, as a producer, 65% of the Broadway audience is tourists. But one of the great tourist magnets for New York City is Broadway. This is why people come here. And that's why if I was on the, if I was certainly in the government, I would be saying, we gotta make sure we get Broadway up and running and safe because it's a symbol. It's a symbol of the literal and figurative health of, of this city now more than ever. You brought up a provocative point in a recent blog that you wrote, Ken, and that was that Broadway coming in the last or one of the latest to open after regional theaters and community theaters and, and uh, touring productions, coming in last after them is actually an advantage. Can you go a little bit into why? We're, we're all wondering when we're coming back. Right, and, and a lot of people are digging deeper and saying like, will our audiences be back, of course, when we open up and what would their mood be like and how, what testing will we require and temperature gauges and all these things. Well, I, you know, I got great advice when I was coming up, which was life is an open book test. To look around you before you make a decision and to see if you can find sample or other people doing similar things. The amazing thing is, People don't realize this, but there are productions going on right now in the rest of the world. So it wasn't very long ago where people were screaming and jumping up and down about South Korea and the crisis there. Well, guess what? There's a production of Phantom of the Opera going on in Seoul, South Korea right now. And there are other productions going on as well there and around the world. And while I think the governor of Georgia is off his rocker to do what he's done, there, and there are other states starting to do this, we will see and learn, not only from protocols, but we will see and learn from infection rates. Texas is opening, they will have mass church gatherings before anyone has theater run, right? Because especially in that area of the country. And we will be able to see what happens. And hopefully mm -hmm. they'll be able to keep the infection rates down. And if people in Texas that like to go to New York City to see shows, see that, wow, Texas, we're okay here. And we're doing a good job. And if they're doing that in New York, I'm gonna feel better about going there. So I'm a big, that we should just be watching what everyone else is doing. 
The Barrington Stage Company recently announced that they would continue their season starting in August later, much, much later. And they were going to produce a show, I think it was The Price by Arthur Miller, in which there are people that are wrangling and have no desire to, uh, to kiss or hug or anything else. <laughs> <laughs> and I suppose we're learning from that, as well as the fact that ART and Harvard are doing a study right now about how to uh, resume performances on Broadway and in the theater. Uh, are you savvy to those? And do you think they're doing enough in that respect? Well, I think it's so creative and it's the type of thought process that I think leaders, producers, artistic directors are gonna have to do. Even when the curtain goes back up, what other steps should we do for a while to make people even more comfortable, et cetera? I mean, people talk about this a lot. They're watching television now, and they see people hugging or gathering and they're like, oh God, they shouldn't be doing that. So that's what will happen when audiences see people on stage doing it, right? We don't mm -hmm. want that because that yanks people out. So what I, what I love, whether it's too soon or not, I'm not gonna chime in on that, but I do love the thought process of like, oh, well, we put one person on stage. I mean, I actually was like, oh, more theaters around the country should think about doing Daddy Long Legs. There's only two people in that. That was one of my shows. So it's a fascinating thought and a very creative thought and something we're all going to have to do. We should probably mention that ART is the American Repertory Theater in Cambridge, uh, and Diane Paulus is working with Harvard to do this study. I want to talk a little bit about your role as a marketer and what theater productions should be doing now and not waiting until they find a date when Broadway is going to open. And I was wondering if you could kind of speculate on what a production like The Girl from the North Country might be doing. It opened, it was not selling well. It opened to rave reviews. I'm sure the producers were probably thinking that they're gonna to get Tony nominations and this would be an impetus to sales. What would you advise the producers of Girls from the North Country, this Bob Dylan musical, should be doing in terms of being able to get back in the game. So, and, and I don't see any shows really doing this, which is, which is good because I, I, not only my own marketing instincts, but I follow a bunch of marketing gurus in, in the world. And the lesson number one during this kind of crisis is don't try to sell anything. Don't try to sell it. No one's gonna buy it. Like don't even waste your time, your energy, your ad dollars. Like, you know, in fact, th there was some early attempts as this was happening, like, oh, we should sell some tickets. Like that. Like that. Forget it, forget it because it's just not gonna work. What we have to do is acknowledge the issue, but that's the first thing, like all brands, and you're seeing this a lot in major consumer goods, et cetera, lots of advertising, people just saying, we're in this together, we know what's going on, like we're with you, we're with you, we're taking care of our families too, we're working from home, we're all in this together. And then what we're, as a community, what we're gonna have to sell everyone on is that Broadway is a comfortable place to be that it's an okay and a safe place to be and we're looking out for you. That's the second thing. And then we're gonna get into the specific of the shows themselves. Uh, and for Girl from the North Country, which is in that very challenging position, it's that last minute reminder of like, hey, we were on your list. We know you were there. It's like, how do you remind people that, because I believe that every consumer has a theater goer has a list in their head of shows they wanna see. And those, those rave reviews launch Girl from the North Country towards the top. So now it's a question of how do we remind everyone that we were the show to see, that they were the show to see. Uh, and that's gonna be the challenge, uh, especially there are gonna be a lot of shows like that, right? We're, uh, you know, this, this goes to the question of do we stagger our openings or do we not? Because Broadway has built into its season staggered openings, right? We don't, we're not like a theme park which opens up at 10 o'clock and all the roller coasters are available. And what happens, everybody runs to the hot roller coaster first. That's what could happen if we open all at once, right? Leaving some of those right. shows empty with no one to ride them. So that's an argument for a staggered opening, which is how we stagger our seasons. All the show, new shows don't open at once. I want to talk a little bit about the tremendous online creativity that Broadway has and Broadway performers and theater performers have brought into the business. But I want to talk to you, you talked about the fact that you were about to workshop and I know that American Repertory Theater workshop their production online of 1776. Would you workshop a production online at this point? 
Yeah, I'm doing a virtual reading of Broadway Vacation next week. Um, we're doing lots of creative development, but that's the work that can still happen. I always believe, in very rare occasion, that any time you gather, even if it's electronically, creative people and work on something, something good comes of it. You learn something, right? So, yeah, I'm a big fan of using whatever tools you have available now to continue the developmental work, since it's usually it's like the only work we can do right now. Do you think it would be an effective tool to raise money to to have virtual, uh, you know, uh, backers auditions? Well, just like I said uh, about it's not a it's not a time to sell anything. I use that for producers as well. I mean, we are salespeople. That's what we do. We're selling people on investing in our show, uh, and this is not a time to be raising money. It's not. It's another one of the reasons I kicked my shows six months to a year. I did not want to be in the market saying like, hey, by the way, the stock market's down 30%. Broadway, you can't even go see a show. You should invest in my show. It's just not the best way to do it. Even when you have uh, very high profile projects, and I do, it's not what people want right now. Even, even if you're worth $100 million and now are only worth $80 million, you're still like, you know what? I, I just am not comfortable. And until there is confidence in where the world is going, people are, aren't gonna make those decisions right now. A small theater in Chicago produced online a play called Teenage Dick, which was a twist on Richard III, and got seven, uh, 77,000 people to pony up, I'm making it up, 20 bucks, which was able to cover the costs. Do you think that this means that some of this online creativity, like this production, will carry over in the post-pandemic world? Some of it will, for sure. But listen, we are, we are so desperate for theatrical entertainment and the theater people we know and love and gather, like, like I said at the top, it's just good to see you. Like, oh, it's like, oh, Patrick, it's like I can have a theater conversation. Like, we're so thirsty for that. We'll do anything right now to get it. Once the theaters are back up in our hometowns here on Broadway, it's seriously going to decrease, right? But there will be some left over. And I think one of the positives to come from this will be the embracing of streaming as a marketing tool to get more people talking about your projects and then eventually get your butt in the seat. I mean, that's something I learned with Daddy Long Legs, actually, to bring it back to that. When I streamed that, it was the first show to do that years ago, is we found that uh, we did it for an isolated period of time, we streamed it online, and then it drove people to the theater. Uh, and I think we'll find that again. We have to wrap up, but what have you been most impressed with in terms of the theater, theatrical community's response to the pandemic? <laughs> It's a very interesting thing because I, I started this live stream wondering how people's moods would be like, because this, this isn't just, oh, a snow day or, you know, this isn't, we're down a couple of days. This is, we're down and we don't know when we're going to come back up. And every person I talk to is out of a job, right? Everyone, doesn't matter where they are in the business, they're out of the job. And what I love about the theater community and I've been so inspired by is that everyone is like, yeah, and, and this is what I'm doing. And this, I talked to David Corrins last night and David started by like, oh, this is crazy. The uh, wonderful set designer we should, we should add. And he, listen, he, he is in a worried state. And then he said, yeah, and every night at seven, I get my trumpet out and I go to the balcony and I, I play New York, New York. And that's the thing. I mean, we're, we're, all, we're all getting through it in the best way we can. Um, theater is a tough business and it's toughened our skins uh, and we need tough skins to get through this but everyone that I know I've been just impressed by their optimism and resilience and the show will go on just when exactly that will be <laughs> last question because we only have a few seconds but um, you're an author of many books about producing is this likely to uh, inspire another book how to produce in a pandemic yeah, it's listen, this is going to inspire what we're going through a whole new business. I mean, Broadway is going to be a different business than it was before. And it's going to have a whole new model and a whole new way to look at it. Because this is an experience that every single theater goer, every single person who goes into that theater will have gone through this, right? Everybody. 
which means it's going to affect the stories we tell on stage, the performers and where they come from and who they are and the audience and the business model and the economics. So it's going to require several volumes of, <laughs> of books written by people <laughs> a lot smarter than me. So I can't wait to read them. So lots of good things coming out of this, despite the fact that there's so much suffering. There, there's always bright spots. There are always bright spots. And that's the hard part. But it's important for all of us out there to do is look at the things that will be improved by this. Um, and we will get some resets and we will create something new. And eventually we will not only survive this, but the Broadway that you know and love will thrive. Again, it just may not be back. We'll have to be a little bit more patient, uh, but we'll get there eventually. And I would say, I would suppose we should mention that Broadway itself and the theater in general across the country will be a great morale builder in terms of getting us past this. Yeah, that's the other thing to remind uh, to remind our governmental leaders is that we're not only the economic engine, we are an engine for the soul. I mean, when people need to forget about this, it's why theater and specifically musicals were created because times were so bad. People needed something to make them happy at night. And guess who's going to be waiting? They may forget about us at times, but we'll be waiting for them to say, hey, everybody, if you need a lift, we've got a <laughs> ticket for you right over here. That's a great way to end a fascinating conversation. Thank you so much, Ken, for joining us. My pleasure. Thanks for doing it, Patrick. And thank you for joining us. We look forward to bringing you more conversations with artists and thought leaders during these trying times. Stay safe and be well. I'm Patrick Pacheco.